Today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Travis Doom. Uh, Dr. Doom is the Associate Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science. He's in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, he's one of our most um, lauded teachers. He's won the awards for the college's best teacher. He's won the award for the university's best teacher. He has won the IEEE's International Award for our graduate teaching. And so he's going to tell us a little bit today about digital design and computer engineering in general, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. So with that, I will hand it over. Dr. Doom, the floor is yours. If you need anything from me, just speak up and I'll click whatever buttons you need me to click. Thank you, Dr. Raymer. So uh, first of all, don't expect the best teacher of anything going on here. I don't know what that was all about, <laughs> but uh, absolutely um, informal is the best. Um, the best way to learn stuff is to ask questions and find out where you guys are. Um, so unmute your mics, chat, ask me questions, particularly because we have a relatively um, easy way to get everybody uh you don't have to raise your hand in the back of a classroom with 80 people right um just let me know if you have a, a concern or a question uh, because this um, series is primarily designed to give a good idea of what remote teaching might look like uh, in the fall if we have uh, continued uh, covid related uh, sequestering or quarantining going on and because it's also kind of uh, in place of the sort of orientations and the on-campus visits that we do for new students. Uh, the topic for this talk is really designed for someone who is a high school senior just thinking about starting into uh, freshman level coursework um, in computer engineering or computer science. Uh, that's my audience thought. That might not be who's actually listening right now. So just keep in mind that that's where I'm heading. And if you have questions uh, that are outside of that range, I'll be happy to answer them. But that's where we're starting. Before we can talk about digital design, I gotta kind of tell you a little bit about why we're talking about it and what it's all about. So um, let's start with the, the concept. Let's make sure we're on the same page. We're making the assumption you're, you're an incoming uh, high school student. So what is engineering? And we could spend not just an entire hour, we could spend an entire four year degree program answering the question, what is engineering? Um, it's, it's not a easy question to answer, but for the sake of today, what I'll say is um, if, the, if science is the use of the scientific method to explore the conditions of the universe, um, engineering is using what we know of science to construct solutions to um, the problems that, that humans have, right? to improve the human condition in some way. Uh, and how one learns engineering is not by just passively listening to some guy talk uh, at home on his computer, right? That's useful to get information, but you learn engineering by building things, right? by designing things, by implementing them, by seeing that solution realized to improve the human condition. If it doesn't make a change, it's not engineering, you know, at the end of the day, at least in my opinion. Uh, so I really believe you have to do that. Um, and if we do things, when we do them online, we have to try to make sure that you're still getting that entire breadth of the experience of engineering practice. So one of my research areas is how students best learn engineering, and that's a career long uh, to answer uh, but but um, the big thing about engineering is it's really about understanding that in order to build something let's just say for example you're trying to build a, uh, a bridge right what you don't do is go out and get a whole bunch of girders and some concrete and some bolts and nuts and start slapping together a bridge right? that's a horrible way to actually solve the problem in order to solve a problem in science, we use the scientific method. In order to solve a problem in engineering, we have our engineering methods. Uh, in the broad sense of things, there are four different aspects um, of the engineering method that we really focus on uh, as, a, as a discipline. Uh, you start off with the concept. What am I trying to solve? What's the problem that I'm trying to solve? And what would a solution look like? Then you get to the requirements. Specifically, what do you mean? 
So if your concept is something like, I would like to get from one side of this uh, body of water to the other, right? um, maybe a bridge is a good solution, maybe a boat is a good solution, maybe floating platforms. Requirements say, you know, here's what we want, something that automobiles can travel across. How many automobiles, how wide, uh, how much money do we have to work with? When, what would be feasible, infeasible? Are there hurricanes? Everything like that that you would have to know in order to determine whether or not your solution was a good solution. What are the metrics that we use? That's all there. Then, and only then, should you really get into the design phase, which is now, how can I use the available tools, technologies, the, the understanding that humanity has of the way the world works right now, all of science and manufacturing, what can I put together to address those requirements? How would it look? Of all the different ways I could solve it, which one is best according to the requirements, uh, the metrics that I was giving in the requirements, right? And then finally, you actually build it. That's the implement, implementation phase. And the implementation phase is not necessarily done by engineers. Engineers really focus on these middle two spots, the requirements and the implementation. Anybody can come up with a problem, right? I shouldn't say anybody can. Problems come from everywhere. That's a better way to say it. Sometimes they're engineering problems. Sometimes they're completely unrelated to engineering. But people come to engineers to help them solve their problems. We help take the idea, the problem, and set the requirements. Here's what, is this what you mean? Or is this what you mean, right? That's requirements engineering. Then we do to the design. And then finally, the implementation, which again, is, is where you realize the uh, end of the process. We're gonna start right now today talking about what design's all about because that's where engineers tend to spend a lot of their time. And we're gonna talk about digital design today in part because it's a really good sandbox for learning engineering of any sort. It's got a very small number of tools available to you. The requirements are relatively simple. Um, so it's just kind of a, a really um, small set of variables for you to start learning to use the engineering process to, to solve problems. Uh, so that being said, we definitely recommend that all engineers, particularly those who are interested in computing, um, study digital design. It's required for electrical engineers and for computer engineers in some form or another, and it's highly recommended for computer scientists, but there's a lot to be learned about the engineering process for any type of engineer, mechanical engineers, um, biomedical, industrial engineers, it's all, we all use the same engineering process. So what we're gonna do now is um, uh, take a step back and use a kind of um, high level example of how design is done by engineers. So one of the things that engineers need to be really good at is solving one part of a problem at a time. Ideally, we use something called top-down design where we take the entire problem and we break it up into smaller problems. And we say, if only I could solve these smaller problems, here's how I would combine those solutions into a system that would solve my bigger problem. And now you've got a handful of smaller problems and you tackle them one at a time, or you set a team of people one at a time. Most engineering is done you know, in teams of some, so, some form. Um, each one of those problems, you can say, mm, this is still too big. How could I break this up into smaller problems? And you keep doing that, breaking things up into smaller and smaller problems until the solution to the small problem is something that you can realize, either it's already existing off the shelf or something that you can, can you know, you can construct from basic principles. Oh, we could build that now. Maybe we couldn't do it before, but this is completely feasible now. We know how to use for it before, but we could build that. And once we have that, everything else uh, comes. So you design from the top down. What am I trying to solve? to what are the parts I need to solve it. And then you actually do your implementation from the bottom up. You build each of those systems, uh, combine them together as you lay it out in your design until eventually you have a solution to the entire problem. This requires us to be able to abstract away the details and just say, here is a black box that can do this. If I had that, here is how I would use it to solve a different problem, a higher level problem. So to give you an example of what that might feel like, um, we're gonna do um, a, a little bit of digital design work. 
So digital design really, um, logic devices that are used in digital design really are in two flavors, those that have memory and those that don't have memory. For now, we're gonna work on memoryless systems, which are called combinational logic systems. Uh, and if, if we had more time, we would talk more about what you do if you have memory. But for now, we're gonna say, don't worry about memory. That's a, a whole different set of black boxes that we'd have to learn about. But let's say that, um, step away from digital design and just say that what I have is a really interesting box. And, and in this case, I'm gonna say, realistically, it's a box, it's a physical box. And this box has a hole in one end, and into that one end, I can put a metal rod. And the length of that metal rod will encode a number. Maybe it will encode a number by the length of the rod in centimeters is a number. And if it's 1.5 centimeters, then the number that it represents is 1.5. And heck, just for fun, we will have one end of the rod be the front of the rod and one end of the rod you know, have a different color or something. And if I put it in backwards, now I have a way to represent negative numbers. Why not? And then there are two holes on the other side of the box. And out of that box, some amount of time later, I put a rod in this side of the box. The other side of the box will produce two identically length rods and in the same orientation. So an engineer would say, well, what you have here is a device where you give it a number, granted it's encoded in a metal rod, whatever, those are details, and you get a copy of that number. You get two instances of that number at the other end. That's great. We're gonna make a little symbol, and this symbol is what we're gonna use in our higher level designs to mean that function the take a value m, and now I have two copies of that value m, all right? This schematic representation is something that I can use in design because we come to an agreement about what this is going to mean. This means this function. Now, how does this device work? What's inside the, that device? I don't know. It could be there's a guy in there with a milling machine and a big bun a whole bunch of uh, stocks of iron rod and he's measuring it and cutting it and that's great. Maybe it's computerized. Maybe there's trained monkeys in there. I don't know and I don't need to know to use this device. All I need to know is that it does its job. As a matter of fact, if somebody comes up with a better way to implement this box in the future, I should just be able to take that new way of doing it, plug it into my design and my, device, my design should get the advantages of using that better way if it's appropriate. So another thing that we generally have to talk about are, you know, if there's better ways to do something, that implies that this device has some kind of cost. And that cost can be in size. How big is the box? I got to store it someplace or put it someplace. It could be a uh, power. It could be how much resources you need to keep giving into it. Uh, metal rod, electricity, um, I guess if they're monkeys, bananas, uh, whatever, right? What does it cost to make this device work? Um, and for the sake of argument, I'm just going to say the cost of this device is one untyped unit. I don't know what my measure of cost is here, but there's all kinds of different types of costs. So I also don't want to give you the idea there's only one type of cost. Cost could be time, cost could be size, cost could be money, uh, how much you have to clean up after the monkeys, whatever you want, man. It's all good. All right. So I've got this device. All right. Let's say I, ha I have um, a couple of different boxes available to me. Um, and that I have another box that can take two rods and put them together end to end. And now I have a rod that is uh, the sum of the lengths. So I put in the encoding for two numbers, one number M and one number P, and I get a new rod that encodes the, the value of M plus P in its length. Great. Let's also assume I have another box that can multiply. So this symbol here is gonna be for multiplication. Now I have a universe with three primitives in it. I've got copy, duplicate, or whatever you wanna call it. I've got add, and I've got multiply. Now, from that, I can start saying, I have a set of primitives, abstractions, that I don't need to know the details about. As a matter of fact, later on, somebody might say, you know what, that whole metal rod thing is ridiculous. We're not using metal rods anymore. We're writing things on pieces of paper and put, putting them in the box. My design should still work. It shouldn't be dependent upon the any aspect of how this device works. Uh, just that it has a way to encode information, process it, and give me the answer.
So let's say that I want to make a new device. This, uh, in my uh, little 30 minute example here, this is a device that's really important to improving the human condition in some way. I want to make a device where you give me the value for a number and it will produce twice that number somehow. So how do you do that? The design process essentially starts again from the top down. So you say to yourself, well, my goal is to make 2M. How do I make this problem of making 2M simpler using the devices that are potentially available to me in my very limited universe of things that I have to glue together to solve the problem? This is a very, very small universe right here. I have multipliers, I have adders, and I have copiers. So I might say to myself, well, 2M, that looks like multiplication. If I used multiplication, that would work as long as I could get 2 and M. 2 multiplied by M is 2M. That would solve the problem. Now, M I can get from the outside world, and 2 would just, I just have to have a, a system where anytime you gave me a number, I also shoved the 2 in statically from somewhere. I could make that work, let's say. Great, now I have a design. And how much would this cost? Well, this particular uh, device just basically uses this cost and multiplier. Apparently, for the sake of argument, this two is free. Um, I now have a new device. And now I have four primitives that I can use to build my next more complicated set of device. You just kind of keep building a library of devices using things that you or other people in the field have created and you share it all. And as you have more and more primitives, you can solve bigger and bigger problems. But of course, someone else might come along later and they might say, this is a terrible way to solve the problem. You know, the way I solved it is I said, well, 2M is really just M plus M. I used an adder. And then I needed to get M and M. But of course, to get two copies of M, since the outside world only gave me one M, I also had to use that duplicator that we have. This costs me one, this costs me five. I now have a way to solve this problem with a cost of six. Fantastic. Everybody is happy as can be. They laud the person for coming up with this great, much, much cheaper times two device. And all of our higher level designs essentially remain unchanged. We just start using it. Right. So again, this idea of abstracting away the details, I can solve my problem without necessarily even knowing how that device works, allows me to solve big problems without getting caught up in the details. For digital design, this is critical because at the end of the day, what digital design is all about is getting electrons to do our bidding. As a discipline, we have Computer engineers, computer scientists, electrical engineers, physicists, chemists, everyone who's involved in the creation of uh, the modern general purpose computer have worked together so that we all as a society can use electrons to send cat pictures to each other or to monitor the spread of COVID or to play computer games uh, in our houses with our friends at night and keep ourselves entertained or what, you know, say hello to our grandmothers on their birthdays. It doesn't, whatever we want, it's a huge number of tasks that have improved, arguably, improved the human condition. And somehow we've convinced electrons to do all this for us. That's essentially what digital design is all about. It's a very, very complicated process, but each level is relatively simple. So let me give you, um, a quick example of um, how we might build something using electrons. In order to solve things with electrons, the first thing that we want to do is figure out how we could use electrons to represent information. Um, and the basic, the basic thing that we, we do here is we say, well, it's relatively easy to measure whether current is flowing or not. So the, the most common way uh, in digital design to use electrons to represent information is to say either current is flowing, which we would call um, off or zero, just to have a simple way to represent it. Current is uh, current is not flowing, off, zero, or current is flowing, uh, which we would we would call true, or sometimes we'd call it one or on, something of that nature. 
So let's say that I wanted to build a new device. I want to build an adder, just kind of like we had in that previous system, where I have two numbers, M and N, and I get zero. How would I convince electrons to do that? The process would start like this. First of all, you have to encode, you have to have a way to tell the device what your values of M and N are. And we're going to start with something really simple. Let's assume for the sake of argument, I want to be able to do one plus one equals two and zero plus one equals one and just a very small number. Let's, let's, we can't solve, uh, we have to set the scope of our problem the requirements. Let's assume for the sake of argument that the only numbers we will allow um, will be M and N can have values between zero and one and that's it. Maybe we'll even get a little crazy and we'll say they can have values up to two. You have to set that requirement. What's going to happen? Once you have an idea of what your values might be, you've got to encode that somehow. So we might say, if I want to represent the value zero, one, and two, that's three different things. Uh, if all I have are the ability to say current is flowing or not flowing, I got to make a decision. How do I represent three different things? Well, if I used one piece of information, on or off, one or zero, that allows me to encode two different concepts. If I want to encode three different concepts, I need to have more information. So here's where I'm going to start to lose some of you beginner folks, but again, keep in mind, this is a many week topic overall. Um, you just pick a number of binary digits or bits that help, uh, that give you enough encoding space to represent the, the scope of your problem. So I might say to myself, well, if I had two binary digits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, there are four options here. That's plenty of code space for me to represent a couple of numbers. Let's just all agree that I will use 0, 0 to represent the number 0, 0, 1 in that order to represent the number 1, 1, 0 to represent the number 2, and 1, 1 to represent the number 3. And that is how we're going to represent information for both the inputs and the outputs. Could I use a different encoding? Absolutely I could. That would give me a design with the different uh, costs, different uh, me metrics for how good it was, advantages and disadvantages. All right. So once you decided this, now I can say to myself, all right, well, so what do my inputs look like? I've got values of M and N. Um, M can be zero and N could be zero. And I know, need to know what M plus N is. So if I added zero plus zero, my answer would be zero. And the code for that is zero, zero. So that would be what M plus N is. And if I added zero, and the answer should be one. And if I add zero and two, then the answer should be two. But M could be one, and I could add zero, and that would be one. And if M is one, and N is zero, the, answer, the sum should be one. And you basically just go through, oops, basically just go through every possibility that satisfies the requirements of the problem as you specified it. I think I said we could add numbers up to two, so I'm going to add zero, 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 one, three. So this is two plus zero, which is two. This is two plus one, which is three. This is two plus two, which is four. Oh no, I have a problem. What do I do if someone adds two plus two in the system? There's no way to represent four. The designer makes a decision. I'm going to say two plus two equals zero. This kind of thing is done very often in digital design. You would then maybe tell the outside world, don't add two plus two, that's not allowed. Or, hey, if you add too much, this is what's going to happen. There are real world situations or cons constraints that we have to think about. Or maybe we say, you know what, we need more bits in our encoding because we need to represent not only zero, one, two, and three, but also four. Those are the kind of design decisions you make in digital design. Once you've got this, then this is broken down into essentially um, uh, mathematics. And the mathematics that we would use here 
would basically work like this. Under what circumstance, I've got this output here. This output, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say we've got O1 and O2. Just for, to make this, and I'm gonna actually do it the other way. O1, there we go, just like that. Um, basically, I have, I can think of this as four different inputs, M2, M1, M2, and N1, and two outputs. And then we can solve this problem mathematically. And I'm just gonna kind of give you an example of how this might be done. When is O2, when does electrons, when do electrons have to flow? Electrons have to flow, change my color, here, 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 and here. So I might say to myself, O2 should flow if M2 is zero. And M1 is 0, and N2 is 1, and N1 is 0. That's these values right here, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. If all those things are true, O2 should be true. Or it should also be true if this, or this, or this or this. So this entire branch of mathematics called Boolean algebra, which is designed for helping us solve exactly these problems. And so we take this solution and we turn it into Boolean algebra and it tells us how we can solve the problem by just breaking the problem up into questions of are things one and zero and ands and ors. So we got to build those devices. Wouldn't it be great if there were devices that we can make symbols for that did ands and ors and nots. Those are called logic devices. They exist. Combine them all together, you solve the problem. How do they work? If we had another 10, 15 minutes, and we can talk about it if you guys want to, we could talk about how transistors are used to lay this out. Um, but in essence, you can go down to the hardware store, pick up a plastic case with some little copper legs, uh, called an integrated circuit. And in here, there are um, transistors that are laid out that if you give current ones and zeros on these pins, it will give you the appropriate output for and or not. So by putting those all together and wearing them up, I can solve my new adder device. Design it, put it in an integrated circuit like this. People now have access to that and they could build something even bigger from that. That's essentially what digital design is all about at the end of the day. So I'm gonna stop and look for questions. But I just have one thing. First off, thank you for taking time to go ahead and go through this. Um, I just finished with my BSCS at Wright State. So um, the reason that I tuned in to this was to kind of uh, see what was uh, being talked about as a CS student. I think you had mentioned that I was not required to take the digital systems course. Um, and it's one area that I kind of have a, a uh, interest in now. So as someone who has graduated, I know it's kind of beyond the scope of this mini lecture right here. Um, do you have any content that you would recommend to kind of deep dive into that as someone who already has a background in CS topics? Thank you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So uh, first of all, Matt, thanks for the question. Um, and uh, um, as a computer science student, you are not required to take digital design, but all computer science students are required to take computer org. So I know you took that. And computer org has just a little taste of digital design, right? You still deal with the understanding of those levels of abstraction, how you go from your, your language down to your microarchitecture. So digital design kind of deals with this part and computer org kind of deals with, I'm gonna just be more general, this whole part up here. Really, it's just the last parts, right? Like once you have right. a language, how do you build it and, and how does the assembly code work and whatever, but I'm sure somebody, said, all right, well, here's a magical device called a multiplexer, and here's a magical <laughs> device called a bus, and here's a magical device called a, a, a control unit or a finite state machine and, uh, and registers, and then they all just work. Aren't they magical, right? Exactly. Yeah, those are kind of the end point for digital design. So it's all the same process, but we just, we live with an even smaller world than the computer org people work with. We start off with transistors work, 
everyone's got to start with something that's magic, right? So for digital design, we say transistors, they work, they're magic, aren't they cool? If you're an electrical engineer, you go a level below that and you say, um, electrons go from areas of high potential to low potential. Why? Don't know, don't care. They've got their level of magic. If you're a chemist, you start with something else, right? Uh, if you're a physicist, <laughs> you're starting with a whole string theory. I don't know what they start with, right? All explaining why the world works the way it does. All right, so you, you did get a, t a little bit in computer org, but um, if you want to learn more about digital design, it really comes down to what your goal is. As a practicing computer scientist, most of the training portion on how to think about breaking problems up, you have gotten now in spades. You did it in your software engineering courses, you did it in your uh, in your programming courses, your operating system courses. You probably feel very, very comfortable taking a big problem and breaking up it into methods and objects and whatnot now, right? Same thing for digital design. But if you want to do digital design, my recommendation is think about jumping right in uh, either with a class or a YouTube video or um, just on your own, you know, grab a cheapo Arduino or FPGA type device where you can, uh, and field program, field programmable gate arrays are kind of like the most accessible way for people to, to play with digital design problems right now, uh, and just play with them. Because as a functioning computer scientist, you can teach yourself this stuff so quickly. So I don't know, that's a long answer. But most of the, the hard part for digital design is teaching people how to be an engineer. If you've already graduated and you've already got that. So the rest is just a little bit of details about what devices are available right now. How could I put them together to solve new problems? And the devices that most people want to use right now, FPGAs or little standalone simple microprocessors like um, Arduino and Raspberry Pis and what have you. Good, good cool stuff. The nice thing about FPGAs, if I'm gonna go back to my stupid example back here. So I made this nice little table and I said, oh, and there's some math you have to do. And digital designers spend a lot of time learning all this math and how to optimize things and make them cost effective, whatever. FPGAs, and I make sure we're all on the same page, field programmable gate arrays. Basically, um, a bunch of engineering yahoos just said, you know what's really efficient and cost less? Things that save me time. And they said, you know what, I'm just going to build a device where you can take this table and shove it into a particular layout of transistors, uh, which we'll call a ROM memory, you know, which means nothing if you don't, but it's a device, right? Just shove them in here, and I'm going to save myself doing all of this work, and it's just going to have a relationship between these inputs and these outputs that you can change by downloading a new set of values uh, at a particular location in this device, right? And now it's going to do this function that you've encoded without you having to understand any of the mathematics or really even what any of the devices are. You just give me a table and I'll do it. If you give me a thousand tables, I can do something really complicated. You give me a million tables, I can do any damn fool thing you'd like. That's essentially what FPJs are all about. It's just a way for you to do digital design by throwing some data in some storage devices that emulate the kind of transistor level stuff that you would get more efficiently in a um, complete design process. But that's really costly in time and fabrication. FPGAs, we can make them by the millions, give them to everybody, they make them do exactly what they want to do in the comfort of their own home or workplace. And it may not be as efficient, but it's so easy to design that it's really dominated the market. I think about 95% of um, the different types of digital devices that are out there right now are, are FPGA. So not by volume, but by, by type, by variety. So there's a lot of really high volume devices like microprocessors, right, that aren't done with FPGAs. But most designs that are done in small shops, they're, they're FPGAs. I'll toss out there as well, I was the program director for the computer science and computer engineering programs for quite a while. I'm currently the associate dean of the college. If you've got any questions about any of the programs, particularly in CS and CSE, but really anywhere, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Or if I can't answer them, 
it's absolutely my job to know who can. So I will make sure you get an answer.